Welcome to Sped Homeschool Conversations, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us tonight as we talk about yoga to foster social, emotional, and intellectual growth. And our special guest tonight is Vanessa Cologne. And so welcome, Vanessa. And thank, thank you for having me. Oh, we're so welcome to have you. And, um, and so I, I'm just going to read your bio, have everybody get to know you, because you have quite an extensive background that you're bringing um, tonight, and we're only talking about a little chunk, but kind of, it, it seems to me that all of the training you've had have kind of come together. And, you know, like you said, as we were talking before this, your passion is this program, this yoga program that you put together. And um, so we're excited for you to share it with us tonight. Perfect. Um, so Vanessa, yeah. So Vanessa has almost two decades of experience and a master's in clinical psychology, and she is no stranger to families whose children have special needs. Um, she started her own company, Cologne Family Services, which she, um, is abbreviated KFS, and it provides behavioral consultation, social skills group supports um, professionals in the schools, as well as parent groups for families with children with um, various learning needs. Um, in her various capacities, she has directed and supervised various in-home behavioral programs all around California, and that's where you are, yeah. right? And um, as well as facilitating social skills groups and, and then developing her own yoga um, curriculum called YEAS Yoga, and that stands for Yoga Education and Autism Spectrum. It's Y-E-A-S. And um, it's a personalized program that Vanessa created to address self-regulation needs in high-spirited children. So welcome, Vanessa. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. Yeah. So, um, so how did this all come about in the first place, this program that you developed? Can I give us the background on that? Right. So um, how it came about was, I want to say for the last, when I was 18 years old, I, I'm 40 now, it, as of last week. So as a, I met somebody and um, I was at a board meeting with someone I was dating back a long time ago and he was telling me about his child. And during that time, I've had about 15 years of working with children with autism. I was in the mental health field already doing an internship and I just wasn't feeling that we were actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is teaching self-regulation, coping skills mm -hmm. um, on so many levels. I feel like we're always telling kids to take a deep breath. We're kind of helping them regulate, but are they learning how to regulate themselves? Exactly. So I met, right, so I met this guy <laughs> who adopted this, this young man and um, had a lot of stuff going on. And then it was just like an epiphany right the moment going, okay, wait a minute. So I actually changed my uh, mentors or my internships to actually hit like I wanted to look at trauma I wanted to look at attachment and I wanted to look at you know adoption and other things like that that are going on so I actually took instead of going like the cognitive way completely I went a different route and I just embraced learning different methodologies in the clinical fields Right. And then I also, with my autism background, I was able to kind of incorporate all of these things. So that's where Yaz came about, where I was like, how can we teach kids to self-regulate? So I would be doing therapy, and then I ended up doing yoga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so much better. <laughs> kids are actually learning how to take a deep breath. I mean, half the time, kids are this breath that's going right here. You know, right. sometimes kids, when they're breathing, if you look, you might take an inhale, and they're doing the opposite of what the body's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So you tell them to take a deep breath and all of a sudden they get into shallow breathing, which can go into like a panic attack. So right. it's really paying attention to that, right? So mm -hmm. it's like how do you teach kids to learn about their own body? And that's kind of how this whole thing came about with this one meeting with this one guy. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of, was, it was like this light bulb that goes off in your head and you're like, that's it. That's what I want to do. Right. Um, yeah. And there's so much so, you know, the kids, especially on the autism spectrum, but even kids with just various special needs, they're so focused on trying to do one thing that um, they kind of forget wh where their whole body is. Right. And and so you, you can, like you say, you know, tell them to do one thing and they think they're doing it, but they really aren't. <laughs> and there's a lot of, and honestly, like there's a lot of fear. So I usually tell, you know, if I have my, like the first couple of sessions, I'll, like the kid is laughing at the end. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's a good sign because that means they're feeling their body and it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you do when you get uncomfortable is you start laughing. And then I'm sure people will be like, can I get uncomfortable? Well, no, just let them, let them laugh and let them be there in that moment. Because the next mm -hmm. time they're not going to be laughing as much because they're actually feeling their own body. Mm -hmm. 
that's my experience. So I think people might think it's a little nutty, but I just feel that the times when you say take a deep breath, and if you're a kid that's going zero to 60 in like two seconds, and then all of a sudden you're saying to take a, a, take a deep breath, and then you're actually going to calm down. That's a different feeling than when you're going from zero to 60, and that's what you're used to doing. Right. It changes their pace completely. Everything. Yeah. And then they actually feel other emotions and other things that are going on. So that's where you get the laughing keys. Right. And it's better they're laughing than being angry because that, I mean, for my son, that was like, what, when he got frustrated, that was what, you know, the first thing that came out was the anger. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I remember one time I have a little girl who was not verbal and she did a handstand and um, it was almost like her eyes went really big and she started hyperventilating and I just held her and calmed her down. But it was almost like there was this moment of like, she's upside down, completely aware of what's going on with her body and what's happening. And I'm telling you, the next day, that's all she wanted to do was be upside down. And if you're looking at being upside down, that's actually reversing the blood flow. It's helping calming the, the nervous system. So you're getting all of that input. And she was completely nonverbal. Wow. So that was very scary for the first time. But I, and I remember having to hold her and like to calm her down because it was like, oh my God, I felt my body. Like I had to actually be aware of what's going on because, you know, I'm on my hands, not my feet. Mm. It's a completely different feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I never even thought of it from that perspective that it's it, the reorientation can yeah. cause so many other things to kind of go off of balance, which in essence is a good thing. No, it's a really good thing because they're actually feeling their body versus just going, you know how we drive in a car and we just know we're going to point A to point B. Yeah. We're not paying attention. So how many mm -hmm. kids are like, well, I'm just going to be in this little body right here and not pay attention because this is what I'm doing. I know where we're going. So I feel like yoga really helps open the child to understand where their body is in space, what they're doing. Um, that has been very beneficial for me to see. But my biggest thing is self-regulation. So how does a child be able to take a deep breath when they're anxious? You know, we just talked about earlier, going to Costco gives me anxiety. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people like that. They just hire people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but in mean, life, you know, things happen that are unexpected. So how do, what, what are the tools that this child has to be able to regulate when he gets anxious out in the community, especially a child who has autism? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of parents that ask us, you know, how do we teach our children to become? How do we teach them to self-regulate? And um, so this, this is some way that parents could easily incorporate, you know, something right. into their day that could cause habits. I mean, that's basically what you have to do is because you can't just teach them and say, okay, when the situation comes up, this is what you have to do. It's something that they have to be doing on a consistent basis so that they draw from it. And it's a, right. something and to it, go to. Right. And it's really important to, be, to remind parents you teach it beforehand, not during the most like. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Like social stories. Um, we got to go through it. This is what you do when <laughs> instead of do it now. <laughs> Like even kids that are not on the spectrum, like you're still doing the same thing and anxiety goes up and they're not sure that they're walking into their soccer practice and there's everybody looking at you. So it's how do you, how, how do you do, how do you work through that? And instead of a parent saying like, take a deep breath, it's more like, okay, you're in charge of your body. How do you calm it down? What steps do you take? And that's to me yoga. So yoga to me is not like, okay, we're doing warrior pose. We're not, we're doing tree. We're not doing any of that to me is like, the mind, the mindfulness in the, like how you calm the mind down. Mm. That, that's where I'm coming from. So like a, right? a focus, a centering almost uh, type of meditations, getting that perspective of, you know, this is me, this is what I can control instead of everything else that's going on around me. Yeah. So the first thing that I do when I, my, anytime I have ever work with a child is I, I have one song that I teach <laughs> breathing to. Um, and that's also creating that muscle memory in there. So my song is Over the Rainbow by Izzy. I cannot listen to it outside of my yoga class because it's I've listened to it thousands and thousands of times because it's the one song that I find actually works and it makes children happy. So I'm like, we're just going to lay down for one song. That's it. And then when they get back and it's up in the, and they, they start talking to the song, I just pause it. I'm like, okay, we're going to actually really do this. <laughs> and we turn it back on. <laughs> and we keep going. And a lot of times, too, I'll put an object on the child's stomach. So mm -hmm. it actually, you're taking breathings. So it's something that is abstract, it's something concrete. So what does it mean to take a deep breath? Right. Oh, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Because otherwise, they, 
they don't associate it outside themselves. And that's something that's outside, but it's still being affected by what's inside. Right. Like they might just blow, but is that really getting that air all the way down there? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, these are things to think about, especially, and also if you're, if you're working with you, if you notice your child is taking a deep breath and then all of a sudden the belly goes in and they're trying to, your, the stomach is supposed to expand. That's one thing I'll do is I'll just put an object on the belly and be like, let's watch it go up and down. That's it. Mm -hmm. How do we make the body go up and down? Then they're in control of the breathing. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And the other thing is blowing on the hand, the arm, which works every time. So you don't need anything like special. Like, you know, I got all these like, you know, balls and stuff that you can do, mm -hmm. which are great. But sometimes in the middle of like a meltdown, sometimes you just want to be able to like blow on the hand and or the arm just to be able to calm the child down. So they start to realize that what they need to do to calm themselves down. That makes sense. That's, that's great because yeah, when your your places and they're having meltdowns, you're not going to have all this nice equipment with you. <laughs> so so <laughs> things like that are definitely good <laughs> good things to have in your um, your wheelhouse. Uh, right. It's meltdown time. What <laughs> what do we draw from? Well, it's right with us. It's our body. Um, right. And, and sometimes it's just you know being able to count down from ten to one. Mm -hmm. and modeling it because another thing i want people to understand when your kids are in a meltdown stop talking yes. and it's like, yeah, not really like, no. yeah. <laughs> well people, people have a really hard time because they think that they can calm their child down in that moment but well, they're not processing anyways everything shut down so mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're in that state of mind it's like you want to look at the visuals and that's where like i have a ton of visuals for kids that i use mm -hmm. when needed when we're out in the community like to take a deep breath if that's what they need it's a lot quicker to process a picture of a breath than saying take a deep breath and they're just wanting to, you know, they might actually move you aside themselves. So they're kind of like X cards. But is what yeah. I seen what you were pulling up before. Yeah, no, totally. So what I have, I'm trying to find my breathing card because I just organized everything a certain way, um, which I was like, where is my breathing card? So actually for, for me, I have like a different way of breathing. So you have bubbles. If they want to do blowing, right? As they're teaching this, um, we have um, the star card for it's their choice if they want to do something else. And also, by just so you know, these were all done by a kid. They should draw all these pictures. She's now in high school, now she's in college, but I'm all about kid generated stuff as you can see but and then you can also pull out a straw for blowing so you want to think of different ways to teach breathing so blowing oh, yeah. um, right or through water okay. um blowing on a feather you know we have a feather right here putting on your hand there you go look at that that thing lit up okay. um also look at different size balls right there's a trick guys if you have a child that has a really hard time it's just very like just has a hard time putting their lips together and like to do it. Having like a room, there's a wait, where is it? You see, size different. Yeah, yeah. So one of those tiny pom pom balls that tiny you can buy at a store. Yes. Right. You could be targeting breathing with different, you know, just how the balls look right there, which is going to be easier for you. Right. Oh, and so give them a choice. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Give them a choice, but also if you have a child, you want them to always, with breathing, you always want them to be successful. Right. Exactly. So if it happens to move down, that's great. They took a deep breath and they blew. There's a cause and effect. So okay. you want to start looking at the cause and effect of breathing, right? Mm -hmm. So even if they barely do it, they put their lip there. Like my hand might just drop slowly. Mm -hmm. And then the child is feeling that they're doing it and that they're successful. Exactly. Yes. Right. So you'll eventually get there. Yeah. It just takes time with doing that. And then the feathers are amazing too, right? So just being able to blow on that. Um, and what else I got here? But yeah, straws, breathing, um, putting an object on your belly, you know, having a visual breathe in, breathe out. You know, those big, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, I think that expands really wide. You can add a science store. Never mind. Forget it. Mm -hmm. I don't know the name of that. I shouldn't mention it, but it's a pretty good one. I can send you the link to it on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> kind of like a putty or. Uh, no, it's one of those things that just expands really big. I can't even tell you what it is. I, I, oh, yeah. those bubbles. Yes. yes. I had a lady on last month who was talking about how she uses that to help kids focus. Um, and and one, yeah. And that's all about the visual, right? Mm -hmm. So you're taking something that they can't see and making it abstract. I mean, concrete. Great. Yes. 
because it is such an abstract thing. I mean, as you get older, we don't, we don't think about it being as abstract, but for a child who is still trying to figure out, you know, who am I <laughs> versus, you know, what am I doing? What is, you know, they don't even separate themselves from mom for so long, but right. they just become self-aware of how they're functioning in that. Um, oh, um, Ivy had a couple comments here. I'm sorry, I missed missed them. I think it was during, she said that she's certified by you um, with your yoga program and um, hired to implement something very similar in Denver, Colorado. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Definitely happy share those links for our parents. And then she said it's called the Hoberman Sphere. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, that I had no idea what it was called. So <laughs> you I probably did. Yeah, my, my training is 10 hours. So I really know it's personality. <laughs> After 10 hours with me, you get it. I'll be like, what was that thing again? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I actually do different trainings in different cities. So I've been in Texas, um, North Carolina, LA, San Francisco. I'm doing enough on San Francisco in three months. Awesome. And I'm hoping to just get some more trainings down. So if anyone is interested in having me come out and certify in the 10 hour teacher training program. Awesome. And you don't have to be a yoga instructor. You just have to like have a passion for helping children. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's all I care about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is so different than what I've, I've heard, you know, of yoga instruction in the first place. It's starting from a completely different Place and it's focusing on the child um, first, right? And just where they're at and what what skills they need. Um, again, going back to you know socially, emotional, and intellectual. That just the core components of how they interact with the world around them. Right. And so one of the things that um, just it happened to be a fluke. Like that just happens in my life. We just happen to be mm -hmm. randomly. I find out um, it works because I was teaching um, at an autism school and uh, it's been the same like I have the same like we start with the same song which we already went over that and then we I, it's pretty consistent but it, with the change I changed things up a little bit but my biggest thing is teaching the sun citation which could take months to do so it's step by step on doing it well I happen to hurt my back on the way there oh, and I walked in and the kids are like it's you know it, it's you know, if you have a child on the spectrum, it's like, it's yoga time. Like, <laughs> there's no other <laughs> friends, so like, yeah. I'm not going to like, I go off the schedule. Oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're feeling like it or not. This is the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I'm so consistent in my, like, I'm just very consistent with my behavior just in general in life anyways. But even when I teach, like, it's the same beginning, it's the same end, it's the same middle. And I'm not kidding you, all the kids taught. They all took mm. turns. They took my phone. They did the songs that they wanted. And when it came down to it, I'm like, oh my God, this was one of the most amazing experiences that they're getting these, they're actually helping each other out. They're going step by step. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see the videos in my training, but it was one of those things where you could see just the processing. I had these little 3D yoga figurines and mm -hmm. just the way that I was holding it and looking up and just feeling it. And then thinking, okay, how do I get in a warrior pose? Because if you think about it, if you're looking at executive functioning skills, mm -hmm. that's a big deal right there. You it have to go, you. right, and to be able to teach it, you're like, right. okay, you can downward dog. So you have to be standing to your hands, like, so if you're looking at standing, then your hands to the mat, then your feet back, each back, right? So right there, we're talking about four steps. Okay, then let's put in like we move our arms up. So that's why I break it down. So my program looks at how do you break down each step to where the child is actually working on the executive functioning skills or working on processing. But the self-esteem that I saw of like, oh, I'm putting this child in this pose and I did this whole sun salutation on my own and I'm like this. <laughs> huh. Wow. I mean, I'm talking about like, this is an autism classroom. Right? It was one of the most beautiful things. And the, guy, the little boy's like, I want to be a yoga instructor when I get older. Hmm. I mean, think about it. downward dog's always downward dog. Cobra's always cobra. You know, these Very things aren't for them. Yes. They, don't do uh -huh. <laughs> they know what to expect. Hmm. But uh, it was just one of those moments where I'm like, this is all, this is a different way to doing it. But it makes sense. Like, how do you get a child's self esteem up, self regulation? They're working on the executive functioning skills, the social yeah. skills. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm all, this is genius. Why has anyone figured this out yet? <laughs> so I did. <laughs> yeah, and well, and you get them in a small enough group where they feel comfortable. 
and they can kind of be themselves and and you know and i found that even when i have smaller exercise classes you know the ladies get to know each other and like oh okay we can really mess up bad and everybody's you know cheering for each other um and so you you don't feel as self-conscious as you would maybe right. if you were in a group where you know everybody was trying to be perfect and look perfect and um yeah yeah we're not doing that not in my class. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm making mistakes <laughs> left and right. It's important to model those mistakes. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> uh, but once again, when you're going into it, so, like, so for example, one of the, pro with the program that I've developed, um, we have the visual schedules. So I just took this one off. But So what we'll start with the schedule for the class, right? So taking your shoes off, you can see a book, maybe a special activity, whatever they want, yoga, partner yoga, Maybe something with the ball and then goodbye. So this is always this is always in the classroom. All right. Right. So, so every time they do, Yeah, so they can see it. So every time they actually do something, that thing is off. Okay. So they can start to see the sequence of the class and what's coming up next. Yes. Okay. And I think one thing that is important to note is that kids, especially on the spectrum, if they don't know what's happening next, what happens usually? Yeah, there's anxiety that it just it, chaos in their mind right. starts to come out to chaos in the room. Definitely. Right, and then and then how long are we doing each activity for, and like how many activities are there, right? And I think that's really important. So sometimes we'll just be able to take our socks and shoes off. That alone can take ten minutes. Yeah, mm -hmm. if there's a step in you. and I stopped fighting that. Well, I, I take the socks, shoes off, but I've stopped fighting socks and shoes because that to me is like whatever. It's not. A, is it a big deal? It's not really not a big deal. Right. That's, that's a very good point because some kids will feel very uncomfortable and some won't be wearing them when they come in your room anyways. <laughs> right. Uh, and I've actually gotten rid of mats. Mm. Like, those kids are like wrapping themselves up and then they're being silly and I'm oh, like, yes. About that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, hello, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's about me, not the mat. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but another thing. Um, let me put that. Um, one of the visuals I use. Where did I go? Um, I might. You're like, how do you get the placement down? Then, right? That's probably what. Hey, where'd it go? Right. Um. Oh, it's behind me. So, like, I'll have hand placements. Ah. Oh, so, yes. You know, little hands. Put hands on. Yeah. Where do you put the hands? Where are they gonna go? right here so i'm able to move this around so depending on where the child is is going to be on the floor or wherever they are i can move this around so i'm not so stuck on it being on the mat because maybe they want to move more they might want to do bigger first motor motions i'm not going to sit there and say you need to be on the mat does it really matter it doesn't matter but as long as i have these things we're good mm -hmm. and then i have um the feet where do the feet go mm -hmm. Right. So there's always a placement if, if some of the kids need that, because the visual, I think, is really important for them to understand, especially when you say, you know, hands on the floor. Once again, that's a, that's a lot of steps. That's a lot of things to process. Feet back, exactly. feet up. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I also teach, too, is generalization. So if you say bend your knees and then jump forward, well, if, I, if you're in tree pose um, or doing something else, I say bend knees, they'll go back to downward dog and, and bend the knees. So you, uh, does that make sense? So you want to make sure that you're teaching the same language with different poses. So it doesn't stop on the same thing. So it's important that they're able to generalize things um, as you're doing it. Yeah. And that's in general with a, a child on the spectrum is, you know, they don't generalize things well. And so to, to be able to introduce each of those those concepts in different scenarios does it it allows them to be able to do that in the rest of their life as well not just right. when they're in you know doing yoga but um, yeah I always laugh when people say yeah I take my child somewhere new and they realize the, they think there's no rules again because they've never been here before <laughs> it's like oh yeah they can't generalize that the same rules are at home or the same rules when we go to visit grandma <laughs> so we learn them all over again <laughs> Yes, I remember the days. <laughs> no, I really, well, like, grandma has different rules always. I, I, have a, I have a thing where, like, that's just, that grandma's rules are grandma's rules. Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, you don't understand them. Like, no, but I really think that grandma, and then I have a dog, and then my dad just barks at her nonstop, and they have this barking relationship, and then I'm like this. 
<laughs> I have to remember it's grandma's rules. I always say, you yeah. grandma. <laughs> oh, uh, but yeah, I mean, so the, that, the reason for the program is really the self regulation. And um, this program was developed for kids that are completely nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's important that you can work with any child. And so I think once you have this piece, this component, because there is a behavioral component, there is a sensory integration component that goes with it, being able to look at a child and say, is that a sensory need or is this a behavioral need? What is it that that child needs, mm -hmm. right? And as a yoga teacher, if you're getting these kids that have special needs, it's really important to have that background to look and say, okay, what is it this child is doing and what are the needs for it and how do I help with that? Right, because so often they're judged by their their reaction, and right. they, nobody looks you know down far enough to say where is this coming from. When you get to the root of what's causing the problem, you solve the problem because right. then you target that with teaching and right. helping them to self regulate again. And where how do we how do we teach them to those those calming mechanisms and other things? So when that scenario comes up in like you say, you have to generalize it um, in this, this, in this instance, um, then they can pull on that. And use it over and over. Well, this, this last week, because um, in my school, because I started a school in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, yeah, and so the kids are teaching now, because I was like, you know what, if you guys want to do all these things, like, okay, take responsibility and you have responsibility in your school. And, and one of the kids said to the other kid, I don't want to do your PE class. And then the other kid's like, I am not doing your coding class. I'm not going to do this all. And I'm like, wait a minute. Can we oh. like rewind this? I call it the rewind <laughs> with a smile. We're going to rewind this. And are, were your feelings hurt that he said he wasn't going to take your PE yeah. class? He's like, yes. I go, well, why don't you say, you know what, that hurt my feelings versus, you know, attacking in that way. Mm -hmm. And it was a great learning moment for everybody. And even my teachers too, because once you see behavior, it's like, Everyone just assumes like, well, that's just what they're doing. And like, no, there's something going on underneath them that their feelings got hurt. They're super sensitive and it's a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that's who they are. But if you teach them the skills, like I talked to a teacher the other day or a director of a, you know, from a three-year-old. And they're asking me, I told you about this. Like they're asking about labels and diagnoses. And I go, let's first take a step back and be like, he's three, number one. Number two is. Let's see if we can be able to teach him in the moment, like these skills that he needs to be able to self-regulate. So he's not grabbing people's toys. He's not trying to like run out the door. He needs to be able to like articulate and maybe he's hitting someone on the head because he wants to play with them. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Because they have like communication skills as well. Right. If you, if you haven't taught a child to say, can I want to play with you? Then guess what's going to happen? They're going to find their own way to play with them. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think it's important to be able to take a step back and look at, and that's where um, the yoga, being able to take a deep breath, understanding the expectations is huge. Well, and two, when you're watching your child do these things, you're watching them respond to scenarios that you aren't in the middle of. Mm -hmm. You know, you're asking them to do simple things. So I could see as a parent going, okay, we're going to move into this pose. What is my child not doing? And why are they not doing it that way? And make me think, oh, well, if they can't do this in this simple format, when I ask them to, you know, like put their toys away or other things, maybe that's why that's not connecting. I mean, it's it's that that communication that you can start understanding your child more by right. just watching how they function with just simple movements. Right. And, and you know, nonverbal communication is 90% of communication anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, like, if, so yeah. if you're... If, and I think sometimes people are like, well, it's really simple to raise your right arm. Maybe it's not in that moment. Maybe they don't know the rights and the lefts. Yes. You know what I mean? So I've actually taken out all rights and lefts. <laughs> like, it's all it's all free will, whatever you want to do. If I say move your leg up, move your leg up. I don't care if it's right or left. And I do not, I don't adjust children. Ever. Like, wherever they're at, that's where they are, and that's perfect. You know, that to me is where... Mm -hmm that I'm not going to sit here and try to make it into a way where they need to be. Because I feel like kids with special needs have someone on them all the time, telling them what to do and what not to do. And, you know, if they're in downward dog and their legs are a little bit to the right, I don't, perfect. That's great. Like, I want them to feel good and comfortable in their body, in their own skin, to where that they could do anything that they feel like they can do versus someone coming up. I, I did this, I had this experience a couple years ago where a mom, um, called me and she wanted to do, uh, her aunt and her daughter wanted to do yoga. 
and she really wanted me to adjust. And like by the third session, she never, she didn't want to see me again. Huh? So it's like, I didn't want to do that. That's not my thing, but she's like, but she really needs this for her PT, her PT said, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, and I understand that there's a time and a place, but I feel like if you're in my yoga class, it's really about getting to know your body, what makes sense for you and how you're going to do it. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I don't need to sit there and tell you that you did something wrong. Yeah. Everyone, like, so a lot of these kids feel like whatever they do is always something wrong. And that's not what I want. I want them to build their self-esteem, their confidence up, know that they can be, you know, a leader in whatever they want to do. And that's what this is about for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, like you said, they, they get, they get judged wherever they go. And, um, and it is hard on them to, and just to be able to succeed at something that they've never tried before, or that's so out of their norm. Um, okay. it, 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 it gives them an extra boost, you know, in, in how they feel about themselves. And, right. And for kids, especially who are, you know, just awkward, they move awkward, um, socially awkward, um, right. be able to say, I can do this. This is something that I can do that I can't, you know, they, there's so many sports that I know my son just wouldn't do or were complete failures. And so, you know, just anything to get his body moving was good um, because we see that um, kids with special needs and on the spectrum, and I know even some of my adopted siblings that are in wheelchairs, they were, my, my one brother, he is a walker, but then uses a wheelchair just because he can't walk for very long. But um, they put on weight too, because they aren't using their body as, right. as much as they could, because it's just, it's awkward for them. Right. I mean, even simple mm -hmm. movements of just like taking one breath in and like doing a gross motor movement. That's another one way that I think works very well teaching, especially kids that or adults that don't want to move a lot, just like an inhale up, arms up, and then down again with one, one, so it's one movement, one breath, right? Okay. And just to be able to feel that in your body. So I mean, simple things, you know, like chair yoga is a great thing for, for kids that they don't want to move around a lot, but they're just trying to figure out what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And parents don't want to argue with them, or maybe it's just putting something on the floor and they have to reach for it and their, you know, their leg is over, you know, their other yeah. leg. <laughs> mm -hmm. Their, their uh, ankles over their knee. Thank you. So you can tell how I teach because I kind of just go with flow with how I teach because I'm like, <laughs> 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 and then when I teach an actual like family yoga class, watch out. My rights become my left, my left become my right, and it becomes a laughing class. That's funny. <laughs> that is hard when you're instructing and you're trying to do it backwards. <laughs> well, I have a lot of dyslexia and processing issues. And you know, that's one of the things too, when you have you have processing issues yourself or you have things, like people will look at you and they're like, oh, she gets it. No, like you just <laughs> 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 if you ask them for directions somewhere, and they'll tell me, go right, left, da, da, da. And I'm like, the person next to me, did you get that? Because I didn't uh -huh. get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me the building that I need to turn by. And, <laughs> and I still will get that wrong. Like, I'm telling you, I keep thinking that I'm going to get this right one day. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> I get lost everywhere. I started taking a penny. When I travel, I take a penny and I flip it. My, you know, my head's are right, tail's left, figure out where I want to go. Because I just stop listening to myself. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, so, I mean, imagine you have kids on the spectrum who, you know, if you don't know them, you're going to be talking mm -hmm. a million miles an hour, and we're doing other things, and the processing it, people just the issue shut down. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, how do you be able to do that? One of the things that I do with kids is wiggle your toes. It's so mm -hmm. simple and so silly, but it works. Just getting that out of your head and into your feet, right? It helps oh, you yeah. just be more grounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another that. one work happen. Mm -hmm. It's a test anxiety. If they're taking a test, like, all right, and no one's going to know, right? That you're wiggling your feet and you're regulating yourself. And they think that's really cool. And I go, how many times did you do it? You know, I went on my toes three times today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's fun. It works too. And it actually, you know, makes sense. I've gotten calls and I'm like, but that's it works. I'm like, great. Yeah. <laughs> you don't don't need the fidget spinner. You just got your toes. <laughs> but yeah, and it, again, it goes back to what you were talking about before was, you know, just having stuff available to you on demand, which is your body to right. be able to get to those calm places because there's so much that our kids 
the kids on the spectrum react to or um, have sensory reactions to that um, we can try to limit them, but they're still going to invade our their space um, okay. just by being out in public and we can't keep them isolated either. But no. to, to teach them, you know, you were talking about this earlier too, is to teach them these things ahead of time. Right. <laughs> but then to, once they feel like they've conquered them, to get them out in the world and allow them to use them. And I don't, you know, yes, your child is going to have a meltdown somewhere. That is going to happen. No, totally. And, but yet, you know, I think people are becoming more understanding of, of that. And especially if a parent is calm and they're talking, you know, just doing some kind of technique, like you said, don't talk too much, <laughs> work on that. Um, but, but just, you know, the, the more practice, the better they're going to get at it. No, that's for I me. Mean, I actually, for my yoga classes, I do a lot of um, social skills stuff too, but I also do out in the community. So I take what we're learning out and then what I call a transfer to parents. And then I take go out with the parent to transfer the skill. Cause I think a lot of times kids are like, I don't know how to do that. I'll do it with Vanessa, but I'm not gonna do it with you. Oh yeah. Right. A little bit, I call it the transfer of skills to where we're gonna give that to mom and dad. And then you're mm -hmm. that they're gonna know that you know how to do it and like you're at least gonna try and do it. And the other thing is I think is really important is to do with like family the, everybody does it together um oh, when we're really? telling yeah when we're telling the child like okay something's wrong with you that was one of my other issues too when i was doing therapy the kid was always inside with me and the parents were always outside and i'm like what message are we sending exactly oh that's so like, very that, true. Mm -hmm. you know that really really hit home of like what are we sending what are we doing on that so that is something that i kind of switched over and said this is what i want to do Definitely. Yeah. I, I think getting, yeah, nobody, I mean, and even for children who may not be on the spectrum that are siblings, it's not like they couldn't use these skills as well. No, for sure. And, and, then, and we all have siblings on that. My computer, let me just grab that charger two seconds. Yeah, two seconds. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, and more than likely, if you have a child on the spectrum, you're more than likely to have more than one. Um, or at least your children that are in your house are going to have other various issues. Like I have one with sensory issues and one on the autism spectrum. And, um, and so a lot of the things that we did with one child definitely helped another child. So I right. definitely that the crossover is good. And, and mom and dad needed it too. <laughs> I need to be able to calm down when my child's having a meltdown. <laughs> so but it's not true because I mean, you guys, parents are a constant, you know, you're, like we talked about this earlier, like do I, I have my own special needs? You know, because I'm always with children, I'm always trying to navigate the world for them. So then when you're not with them, you, you know, you're constantly on high alert no matter what. Yeah. So, and I think as parents being able to take care of themselves and being able to use yoga as a tool to be, to do together as a family, is huge and another thing you guys like a lot i think i'm not saying this for every parent it's hard sometimes for parents to play um and to get on the floor it is mm -hmm. and so yoga i feel like it's more mainstream where parents can actually downward dogs downward dog right and other things are the same thing where parents can do that with the child and it's a thing that you do together and there's also touching involved like yoga is pretty intimate mm -hmm. Um, especially if you're a kid with a lot of sensory needs that's that needs to be held or you know needs a little bit more pressure on their body mm -hmm. or pillows or whatever they need you know but i think it's a great way to connect and just to reconnect and just to be like friendly kid friendly but also a way that you know having your belly on your child like having your son or daughter's belly like head on your belly as you're taking a deep breath that's another avenue that you can be able to connect with your child and also teach them the self-regulation skills and you're doing it together but mm -hmm. also modeling to your child too like you know what today at work yeah like, mm -hmm. i had a bad day and like we need to figure it out just you know mm -hmm. it depends on where the child is developmentally but i think it's important that to, to be able to have that connection and to be able to touch and to be able to um calm down the nervous system yeah yeah right? definitely mm -hmm. and, one thing to think about for parents, when you have a child that's a little escalated or whatnot, um, if you're looking at yoga poses or whatnot to be able to be more calming, is you want to think about the head below the heart, right? Oh, and yes, it, it, the blood flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it also relaxes. And anything that the, the child is like, 
I don't want to move. I'm tired. The head up. So like warrior poses or things like that. Um, tree, you know, those kinds of help with focus, um, balance and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Good suggestions. Yeah. And just getting them to, to know those things and, and to be able to, to draw on them again. That's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, I think from just understanding that when they're getting upset, just not talking, but also yeah. like, teaching them the breathing beforehand. I'm telling you the song works really well, especially if you don't pick like five songs. We're not picking five songs, we're picking one, one song, mm -hmm. right? And then it's like, as you're driving to soccer practice, that song goes on in the car and automatically, because they have that muscle moment already in there, their body starts to relax and they start to do it. So you don't even have to tell them to take a deep breath. It becomes automatic. Right. And so when I put that song on in my sessions, the kids are on the floor and they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Without me saying anything. Yeah. And then I give that song to the parents and then it works out on their own when they want to like de-escalate a situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see how that would work. And we, we connect so well with music and um, yeah, I know my, my oldest didn't like a lot of music, but there were, you know, there were certain songs that who's always drawn to. So definitely figure out what your, your child is connects with. And it, you said something a little kind of happy and, um, Oh yeah. Over the rainbow. I have, yes. Yeah. Over the rainbow by Izzy. I haven't found, I usually test music out first to see like what would work and what's not going to work for the child. Because if I see them like covering their ears, I'm going to turn off, but I have not had an issue with that song. Really? That's Ever. great. I don't know why I've had other, issues with other songs, but I haven't had that, that mm -hmm. issue. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's a good one to know. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about social and definitely a lot about, you know, emotional. And what about intellectual growth as far as helping a child to, um, to kind of build on, you know, the, what they're learning? I, I, I guess I'll let you explain that. Cause I, I'm. Uh, no, so what we talk about executive functions functioning and that piece on their processing. Um, the social skills, being able to do that, doing step-by-step, -step, being able to foster communication, mm -hmm. right? So you have the communication piece in there on that. And then also if you're doing, so what I also found with like ABA, you know, when you're doing yeah. ABA, um, you know, it's like touch your fingers, you know, do all these touch finger, what is it? Do this, do whatever that all that language is. I found that you can still do the same thing through yoga. Huh. Right, so your fingers go on the mat, but what are fingers? Right, okay. what's your hand, your palm? Like you're constantly teaching like body parts or being able to teach um, letters through body movements. Ah, uh huh. Okay. When you're looking at how is a child learning academically, you can mm -hmm. still do that through yoga. Got it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm hmm. Because they're like body parts are big thing. Yeah. For the younger kids on there. But for the older kids, I believe that the executive functioning is being able to plan something out, to teach mm -hmm. it, to be able to step by step on what how they're gonna teach it. Also looking at the room and monitoring the room if the child is getting it or not, what they're teaching. And you'll see like in my videos and my training, they're looking up like there's this. Okay, yes, okay, and that. <laughs> Right, so tracking and, and yeah. Right. Really and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure that everyone's doing their own thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that to me is like the intellectual piece on being able to be able to look at, you know, the academics on what's being taught. You know, that you're looking mm -hmm. at body parts, prepositions, um, all those things that you can do during a yoga class. Oh yeah, over, under, around. Yeah, yeah. you're teaching the, instead of just it being a word, it's something that, I interact with or that is happening in around me and so I can actually experience it because those words are really difficult to understand in general for anybody um, but when you're you're having to move your body to it I can see how it becomes so much easier to connect with yeah and, and also neural nets get developed a lot quicker well, I'm glad we had this conversation because I think a lot of times people look at yoga as like a fun activity and not look at 
the benefits behind it. We're like ABA, you know, everyone says you have to have like 15 to 20 hours of ABA and there's research based on everything else. And, and they look at like, well, yoga, mm, maybe we'll, we'll do OT and everything else, which is all really important stuff. But I feel like yoga is just as important to be able to put about the mind and calming the body. Mm -hmm. And also you're teaching too at the same time. Right. And you're incorporating a lot of therapies all into, because I've talked to different therapists on our show and you're kind of drawing from all of those different techniques into just a focused time. So how much time do you spend like on a regular schedule? Is it every day? Is it so many times a week or oh, yoga? Yeah. Or with, like with a classroom or if you, if a parent was to start doing it at their their home right. as part of their so school. for it depending so like what is the goal right so if you, if you want to be teaching breathing I would do ten minutes okay you know maybe two, two times a day mm -hmm. um, I you know maybe the song twice and then start incorporating it more and more um, but I don't push but if a, a, a child a parent was to come to me the first time I'll say well, I'll try for forty five but if I see that the child is starting to fade a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's done. We have to. We always have to end on a good note. That's yeah. that's all I care about. So there has to be some. What, yeah, there has to be some flexibility on, if not so rigid on time, right? If I say forty-five minutes ends up being, you know, twenty-seven minutes, I don't want to hear about it because yeah. I'm looking at what the child can handle. Yeah. And if you're thinking about it, like I'm, t I'm constantly touching the child. Not, and I'm not adjusting, but it's like. I'm going to be moving that here and I might move the foot somewhere else or not. But once they're in, I'm not adjusting if they, if they need help. But I'm also looking to see, like, if I say bend knees, can they do it? Like, I might be touching their knees. If they're in child pose, I'm going to give them deeper pressure so they can feel their breath. Anytime you're in child pose, you're going to get more breathing in there because um, you're going into the lower back area, right? So you're expanding in that region, um, which is actually very calming. Hmm. And it's probably one of the most intimate yoga poses there is because your head and heart are connected. Um, yeah, so I mean that that's and I and I know him a lot too. Like I have a strong personality and I'm assertive and I, I also have a behavioral approach. So like mm -hmm. I say it's gonna happen in a nice way. Once I get to the child, it's gonna happen. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. most people will back off and then kids will be like, Oh, I know how to work this one. Does that make oh, sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So like, I work with kids like that. <laughs> yeah. My dog works me, but other than that, like <laughs> A child can communicate back to me, like, no, we're going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. But doing it, you know, to me, it's being able to walk in without an agenda. I always tell people this. The minute you have an agenda walking into a yoga class, you're done. Mm -hmm. You're not meeting the child where they are. So you need to be able to meet where they are, figure that out, build that relationship, and then go in. Mm -hmm. You don't just go in and then expect the child. I mean, they be running out the door. And then if they figure out, like, okay, well, I could play this game and I can, you know, this cat and mouse game, because mm -hmm. the person doesn't have a behavioral approach, then you're in trouble. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. And I also tell people, like, give yourself time at the end of the session, because a lot of times kids don't want to leave, at least with me, and mm -hmm. so they'll have a huge behavior. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they want to continue on with me. So it's one of those things where you want to give yourself extra time, too, mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. Well, again, to, to end it on a good note. That, Always. You know, yes. And, but, you know, you say not going with an agenda, but you have things that you can pull from, you know, to, to work on. So it's, but it's however the child responding is the way you go, I'm assuming is kind of how. Right. I mean, I really don't have anything. Mm. Like I, I go in and I'm really just present with the child and then I listen to what the child, what, what they're saying. Yeah. That's how I teach. Um, I have a toolkit from like all the years of experience, uh, but it doesn't mean that toolkit's going to work with this child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's going to be me following their lead on what they want to do. And, you know, a lot of that is being able to um, listen to what they're doing, looking at the nonverbal communication and mm -hmm. seeing like, are they pushing away from me or they're not? Am I allowed to do that? Yes, there'll be a breathing. So that would be my agenda. But depending on how that breathing comes out um, or times it's just like really just connecting in a way that the child feels safe and secure. Mm hmm. And then going from there. But if you're coming in with like, oh, I got a plan that we're going to go to that, you know, we're going to go to Mars and then go on as astronaut and then do all these things. Well, first off, that's a lot to process. Yes. Right. It's like they're not going to understand some of that. Like you're going to jump like a frog. I don't know what that means. 
Mm -hmm. and then you have to look at your language too. And that's part of the training that we talk about. Right. What language do you use while teaching? Mm -hmm. So it's so concrete so they get it. So it's one of those things where really just following that, the child's lead of where they want to go. Yeah, definitely. They, and they, they each have their own indicators, I guess, is what right. you would call it as to, you know, what, what are they responding to? What are they not responding to? Where do I need to pull back? Um, and yeah. you just know that when you've worked with enough children or, I mean, a parent with their own child, they, they should know a lot of those things already. <laughs> yeah. No. Good. Not I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I do these trainings and I train and there's always a couple of people in there. Well, how many times do you teach before you do this? Well, I don't teach that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you X, Y, and Z, and then you're stuck. And then that child's going to be one. And then in my head, I'm like, oh my God, I just made that horrible session for that child. Mm -hmm. You got to use your intuition. Yeah. And that's where, that's where that, com that comes in is if you don't have the intuition, I'm like I say, you either have it or you don't. But if you're going to come in with like a, a strict plan and they have to follow this plan, that's going to backfire, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, it might be good for a little bit, but nobody wants to be told what to do all the time. That's you know, true. Right? And that's why I'm like, well, we'll just do one last thing on that. But, you know, they always have choices with my program. Like, what do you want to do? Breathing, music, or yoga? But there's always a choice. They're really in control. I might have this schedule. Again, I think I told you about this. I'm really not. I, my kids are always in control. But I give them the schedule, but they might come up with their own schedule. Maybe we're going to do something silly at the beginning and then breathing at the end. Does it, once again, it doesn't matter to me as long as it gets done somewhere, somehow. And they have a voice and they're heard. Mm -hmm. so really, like, I'm all about choices. We have a first them board, so they understand that. Some kids, they need to be like, okay, I'm going to take three breaths, and then they get a break. Okay. Right? So they're going to get a reward, like, three, you know. So, they, so once again, we're making it concrete. Like we're gonna take three breaths and we're gonna take a break. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. Uh huh. Because yeah, otherwise, yeah, it, it seems so unconcrete. But when you put it on a visual schedule, it, it they help. It helps create that bridge of right. what what we're doing to what the rewards are, and um, just the step by step process of um, how we're gonna proceed. And again, it's that back to that anxiety. Um, of I don't know what's going to happen, and and if you do give them choices, that that does even reduce more anxiety because they're like you know I know I've done this before, and I know when I do this, I don't feel like doing that afterwards, you know, yeah. and so they can respond to that. Um, but again, they can't always communicate that, especially if you're working with nonverbal children, and you get a meltdown instead, <laughs> instead of <laughs> I just want a different choice. Um, right. So that's something to respond to. First. And that's why spending time like building a relationship first is the most important thing. And like, if you have a child that's nonverbal, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very upfront with parents. Like we might not be doing yoga for a couple times. It might just be hanging out and kind of figuring things out and like what their, their body needs uh, from there. I'm not going to come in and get, once again, I force myself to do something. And by the way, what is yoga? Like, that's just another weird word. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like, like, what is that, you know? Um, but it's really just building that relationship first and knowing where their threshold is. And yeah. I'm also a big believer that if you're not pushing and you're not having behaviors and you're not doing your job too. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act because you want to be able to increase the frustration tolerance of a child so they do get this skill set. And some parents are not comfortable with that. Yeah. And then I take them out in the community. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do. They need to they need to understand what their tolerance levels are because right. I mean, if we're, we're moving to a point of self-regulation, you can't self-regulate if you're not regulating. Right. It's it's basically like I'm living under this umbrella of protection and this is where I'm always gonna stay. And so the sheltering your child too much, um, but you have to know the boundaries of, you yeah, know, where that child is going to be safe and not. And that goes back to what you were talking about is relationship and, and really being able to navigate that well. Right. And then when you have that relationship with the child, that's where you can make mistakes and you can say, I've made a mistake and can mm -hmm. we go through this again? And I, I'm all about, you know, it's not me as the teacher, the child's teaching me, mm -hmm. you know, and I am going to make mistakes and we are going to do that, but it's like, how do we make that together and how do we grow together? Yeah, and I'm sure you see this in your private school too, and uh, and homeschool parents, 
this is something that we always tell them is, you know, even trained teachers, they, they try what, what they think is going to work best. And we, we feel like we should be beating ourselves up because we're failing at teaching our kids perfectly every time. Well, that happens in the school all the time too. <laughs> and so um, we just learn from our mistakes and we move on. And right. um, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's how I learned to teach my kids was just, you know, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Let's try something different and uh, forgive mom, please. <laughs> My kids in my school, they will keep it. They, they will remind me over and over again it didn't work. And they'll tell me, and I like sometimes say, what's going to work and what's not going to work, guys? You just tell me because I can't guess anymore. And they'll tell me. And now I have kids teaching because, you know what, that's what they really wanted to do. And I'm like, great. And I got to tell you, another brilliant idea. <laughs> Their self-esteem is going up. They're, I mean, we have one kid teaching coding 45 minutes, three times a week, 45 minutes. Wow. And he's teaching himself at home and he's bringing it to the school. And then the mindfulness one we do every day for 15 minutes. He has a candle. And then he came in the other day with a piece of paper. And I'm like, what is that? He's like, it's guided imagery we're going to do. I wrote it. And I'm like, huh? And then I got another kid doing E, which is like 10 minutes where they're doing like Mount Everest and other things like that. And he's like, and 20 push-ups. And they're feeling like they're empowered, right? Yeah. And they're heard. And like, we're doing it too. And I'm like, I guess you're my teacher. You know, yeah. I think. You know, just because I'm an adult doesn't mean I know it's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. All the time. Kids will tell you what it is. Yeah. You know, and they'll tell you, like, you know, you're having a bad day. And I'm, I'm like, you're right. I just need a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't take it personally. <laughs> I have a blog on that, too. It's not personal. Nothing mm -hmm. is personal. Everyone has to go through their own stuff. And when you take things personal, that's where the behaviors and that's where, like, no, you have to listen to me, and no, it has to be this way. It's not. You know what I mean? It's a give and take with everything. And people, kids are allowed to have a bad day, just like adults do. I think we forget that. Oh, that that's, yes. That is so good. De definitely. <laughs> I mean, I, yes, they, they just do. And I, I remember there were days where we just said, ah, school is not happening today. Um, we just need to go out and maybe go to the library or, you know, go to the park or, yeah. Climb a tree in the backyard. <laughs> that's that's yeah. what we need to do today. Um, I hope this doesn't get out too far, but that's totally me. I'll be like, you know what? If we're all having a bad day, let's just go and get out and have fun. Like mm -hmm. I will be the first one to be like, okay, academics are not today. Yeah. We're just going to go so Everywhere you go, they're always learning. And I no, yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And I'm not one to be inside and confined. So mm -hmm. if I'm in like a week in the school, I'm like, I need to get out of here. We're going to go do something. Mm -hmm. different something fun and like just get our bodies moving yeah yeah well thanks Vanessa I, this has been a great great discussion and just just for parents to think of you know because I think looking at the title we're thinking yoga and um but definitely it's using a lot of the techniques um that yoga has to help children that are struggle in these areas and building on those skills with um, just the basics, like you talked about, you know, breathing and and just positioning and and executive functioning. We don't we don't often think in those um, therapeutic terms when right. we think about we think exercise. Oh yeah, it's exercise and stretching, um, but but yet it can be a whole different take. On, on therapy instead of, oh, we're going to this therapist and this therapist and this therapist now. You know, kids get shuffled from one therapy to another instead of, oh, of you know, really interacting in as a whole body, you know, mm -hmm. as they're, and, and this, that's kind of what you've been talking about this last hour on just how can we incorporate all those things to, to address the whole person and right. from, where they're, from where they're at, which um, is so important instead of just... Oh, making it another program. And also, if you want to know, yoga is all about breathing, one breath, one movement, and it's about the stillness and being able to calm the body. So, I mean, we're all tapping into that, and I think that's the biggest thing with um, children who have autism, is being able to feel their own body and then being able to calm themselves down when they get anxious. And how are they learning how to do that? Because mm -hmm. ABA is, you know, one thing, but they're not teaching self-regulation all the time. Right. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be a different component. Insurance doesn't want to pay for that piece. Right. Yes. Right. So, um, oh, yes. We can we can have a whole other hour about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's all part of there. But it, it's just 
something that, you know, I think it's important that it's great with exercising. It's great with being able to give the proprioceptive. It's great to center the child and also to feel their own body and to make those right decisions that they need to do to be able to self-regulate themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's so very good. So um, for just for our viewers, if you want to connect with Vanessa, um, her website is um, Vanessa Cologne. It's um, V-A-N-E-S-S-A-K-A-H-L-O-N.com. I wish I could show it to you on the screen, but I am not being able to do a screen share for some reason after you dropped off for a while. It just... Sorry about that. Now my dog's barking. Yes. <laughs> so, so we'll wrap it up here. Um, it, we started a little late, so we're going to finish a little late. But um, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight and um, for your comments. Um, and I do thank the Learning Disability Foundation of America for partially funding our broadcast. And for viewers like you who donate, we are a nonprofit, um, 501c3. So we appreciate your donations to keep us going. Um, we do keep the conversation going all week long in our support group on Facebook. We have uh, 1.6 thousand members there. Um, so definitely join that if you're a parent. We only allow parents to that homeschool to join that group because it is a support group. Um, we have other groups to share resources to. So on our Facebook page for all of that. But um, thanks so much, Vanessa, again. Sorry, for, I don't my dog right uh, now. That's okay. <laughs> At least she's small and doesn't make a whole lot of noise. <laughs> but next week, we um, have another guest in, who's joining us, and she's going to be talking about um, learning through games and play. So that's we're going to be finishing up our month on movement. And um, so thank you all for joining us. Again, thank you, Vanessa. And thank everyone, you. have a great night.